Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Book Trek 2024, the summer of Trek. Much neglected. It's dilithium crystals all but depleted of energy. <laughs> I have not done Book Trek videos when I really should have been. Uh, unlike a couple of other BookTube events where I have not been making regular videos, when it comes to Book Trek, which is designed by Vin at Revenant Reads and hosted by his Dauntless Bridge crew, uh, to get you to read Star Trek fiction all throughout the summer, which is a time that we all associate with Star Trek. Uh, unlike with a lot of those other booktube events, with this one, i it's not that I've been doing the reading but not making the videos. I haven't been doing the reading. I'm not quite sure why. Ordinarily, I read a lot of Star Trek, or reread, more importantly. I reread a lot of Star Trek every summer, but for some reason this summer I haven't been doing it. Uh, it's possible that some long-term disillusionment with Star Trek as it currently stands has just finally percolated into my reading subconscious. I don't really know. Uh, but uh, I wanted to do a little more. I wanted to do a la at least a, a la one last week of Book Trek before it disappears. Uh, so last night I read a new book, a book that I don't think is out yet, uh, by Greg Cox, L Star Trek, the original series, Lost to Eternity. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a lot good and a lot bad about this book. All the bad stuff about it, all the bad things about this book, are more important than all the good things about it. Uh, so on one level, you could say that this was not a good book. Uh, this has three major plot lines. There are three major stories taking place here. So that's fault number one, is that this is over busy. It's overburdened. Uh, Greg Cox might think that he can do all three of those plots equal justice and balance them efficiently in a novel, and he is wrong. And he ought to have friends or, or a writing group to tell him that. Uh, as it is, he tried it, and it, he fails. It, it doesn't work. And also, uh, two of the plot lines that, ha that, are, that are present in this book are very much secondary to the third, which is the obvious thing, the obvious gravitational center of the whole book. So... It's not like they're even equally interesting. Uh, the obvious gravitational center of this book is Gillian Taylor, who uh, you might not know that name, but you will know that Star Trek character. She's a Star Trek character in canon. And you might not know the name, but you will know the character because she was a main character in the most popular Star Trek movie of them all. Star Trek The Voyage Home, which no one knows. The ordinary people out there in the non-Trek world don't know that Star Trek has that Star Trek Four is The Voyage Home. Instead, they think of it as the one with the whales. Everyone who thinks about Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, thinks the one with the whales. In which a mysterious alien probe comes to Earth. It easily disarms the entirety of Starfleet and the entirety of the planetary defense systems. It has carved its way through the Klingon Empire before this. It has no hostile intent, apparently, but it is able to just shut things off. It's able to just swat all of Federation technology away easily. It parks itself in orbit near Earth and starts sending out insistent signals to Earth's oceans. And those signals are not being answered. But in the meantime, while those signals aren't being answered, Earth has no power. None of its planetary systems have any power. So the planet is dying. It absolutely needs those systems. Uh, and Captain Kirk and his crew have recently been on planet Vulcan. They have been recovering from the events of Star Trek II and Star Trek III. Uh, they do not have the Enterprise. They have a, a hijacked Klingon bird of prey, which is a fourth, a third the size of the Enterprise. Uh, and they are using that to come back to Earth to face judgment for their the decisions that they made in Star Trek II and Star Trek III when they realize long-term what, what's going on. Uh, and Mr. Spock determines that the probe's signals are being sent to Earth's oceans. And he further narrows it down that they are being sent to humpback whales, which don't exist anymore. In the 23rd century, they are extinct. They were hunted to extinction. Uh, yet another, uh, one of the last little grim notes about the future that waits for our present time before we get to the sunny future of Star Trek. The original series of Star Trek gives a few hints like that. World War III, for instance. Uh, but here we learn that humans exterminate humpback whales at some point in, in our near future and Star Trek's distant past. And so, on the fly, Kirk decides, well, if humpback whales are needed to save Earth, then we need to get some. 
Uh, and this confuses Dr. McCoy. Now, wait a minute. I thought you just said that humpback whales didn't exist on Earth. Uh, of the present. Now wait just a goddamn minute. <laughs> he says, yes, that Kirk is going to get Mr. Spock to somehow come up with magic formulas that will allow this battered little Klingon bird of prey to go back in time to the 20th century where Kirk can find two humpback whales and somehow convert a, a hangar bay or a store shed or something on this Klingon bird of prey into a space big enough to fit them and then bring them back safely and alive to the 23rd century where they can tell this probe what to go do with itself. <laughs> it's a, an absolutely harebrained scheme, uh, but it's the only one, as Kirk says, if you've got a better idea, now's the time. So uh, they do, and they go back to the 20th century, and they find two humpback whales, George and Gracie, who are in captivity in a uh, an oceanic park in Sausalito. And they are being cared for very lovingly, very knowledgingly, very lovingly by Dr. Jillian Taylor, uh, who doesn't know who these two weird strangers are, but uh, but is eventually falls in with them. Uh, because Spock, <laughs> a classic moment, Star Trek for the voyage home, the one with the whales, is absolutely full of classic moments. It is absolutely full of them. The moment when, when Captain Kirk sees that his first officer has torn, taken off his Vulcan robe and dived into the pool to swim with the whales and mind meld with them, Shatner does it perfectly. Everybody does it perfectly. Uh, and so on and so forth. The, the whole movie has just one set piece after another that is all just perfectly done, no matter how nonsensical the plot is. Rescuing Chekhov from 20th century medicine. Rescuing George and Gracie from a whaling vessel. Uh, right on down the line it is it is infinitely an infinitely lovable movie uh and they they succeed they as you know if you've seen the movie if you haven't seen the movie oh boy do you have a treat in store they get george and gracie back uh to the 23rd century admiral there be whales here <laughs> and it works they say whatever they have to to the probe uh and it goes away it is not defeated. It is not rendered explicable. Uh, when, when I watched that movie uh, at the climax, I thought, well, wait a minute. If George and Gracie know how to answer this thing, then now Spock knows how to answer this thing. Why do, they, why do we need George and Gracie, and why doesn't Spock tell us what all this is about? I thought that at the climax, when our cast is playing around in the pool that is meant to represent San Francisco Bay, uh, and then we got to the ending of the movie, and I didn't care anymore because the ending is absolutely perfect. Oh, my God. Just absolutely perfect. I don't mean just that Kirk is demoted to captain. Uh, but the scene, the final scene between Spock and his father, Sarek, is as good a scene as Star Trek gets. Just, just wonderful. I remember watching Star Trek Three. Of course, is my is my favorite Star Trek movie, but the beginning of Star Trek Four is Mister Spock trying to learn how to be a Vulcan again, trying to learn how to be a living computer again. He has a bank of machines asking him random questions, bombarding him to test his knowledge, and one of them throws him off his game by asking, "How do you feel? How do you feel?" The others take it up until they're all chanting at him, "How do you feel?" And Spock is confused because his training has been in the Vulcan way. And we get to the end of the movie and Sarek is leaving for Vulcan now that this crisis has been averted. And he says, do you have a message for your mother? And Spock says, tell her I feel fine. Oh, <laughs> uh, And even the, the choreography. It's only when the big doors completely close on Sarek in the background that Kirk and Spock are together again and walk off scene. Oh, just perfectly done. Uh, after I had that kind of an ending, I didn't care about the little inconsistencies in the story. But I was curious. I, I think every fan was curious. Well, what about Jillian Taylor? She's now become yet another person who is from the 20th century, stranded in the 23rd century. What about the whales? What happens with them? Uh, and Greg Cox is... If you've read any of his other Star Trek novels, you know he's a huge Star Trek nerd. Huge. He knows the lore, as the, the Twitch streamers say. Uh, 
and you get a bucket load of that in this book not just in that one plot line but in the other two as well he is so big on that on uh what the neckbearded quasi-fascist tv youtubers call member berries he's so good at that almost every original episode of the show is invoked in one way or another here a ton of stuff from the movies is in here it's amazingly satisfying it's amazingly satisfying i don't deny that at all he forwards a plot a plot that will tell you what happened to dr jillian taylor and what happened to the whales a forwards a prop that will look a little at the probe that will look a little at other characters including later characters in the show and their later dynamics uh a, a huge injustice here that jillian taylor is not on the cover of this book no idea why that is uh but that part of it is well done but that part of it is not good <laughs> that is not a good part i realize that if you're writing a novel about the original series then you're dealing in nostalgia territory anyway. Because the original series has been abandoned by Paramount. No uh, canonical, in other words, on-screen incidences of this, of this series happen anymore or are ever going to happen. It is, I, know, I know that Paramount's spokespeople will say otherwise, but it's incredibly obvious that the current New Trek TV shows are intending not just to adapt in little bits and pieces here and there, but to rewrite canonical Star Trek. It's incredibly obvious that that is the case. Uh, and that, therefore, this entire continuity will be gone completely. The new Trek, especially Strange New World, says that it is set in the Roddenberry universe and not the Kelvin timeline, but it's not. It's not. You don't have to be picky about Star Trek to know that. It's just completely wrong all of it is completely wrong so it can't be that no matter how entertaining it might be the list is incredibly long i was telling it to you two years ago it's only gotten longer since then of ways in which strange new world cannot possibly be a prelude to the original series cannot possibly be uh and that that's fine you want to make a splinter star trek of your own i've largely given up on star trek as you can tell i've largely given up on star on the old star trek or on any sense of return to the old Star Trek, I've largely given up on the idea that that will ever happen. I'm largely content with the fact that that is all one epoch, that it started with the original series and it ended with the final episode of Star Trek Enterprise, and that's that. So I've got that body of stuff that's all thematically interconnected. I can just I can deal with that no matter how many times things from that body of Star Trek appear in New Trek. I can still just ignore that because I have that body and it's consistent. I can just leave it at that, or mostly consistent. Uh, uh, what was I? What was I? What was I going on about here? So these, all this pent up Star Trek episode, uh, this start, spent up Star Trek energy. All right, uh, you've got all of that, but this is abandoned. This whole timeline is abandoned by its corporate overmasters. So why are we getting books like this? Why are we getting books that are just? A very, very old Pavel Chekhov sitting next to you on the couch, your knees together, paging you very slowly, in fact, too slowly, through his old Star Trek photo album. Why are we doing that? Why? I know that Greg Cox would say that he isn't doing that, that, in, in fact, the two other plot lines here really stir things up. But he's not allowed to stir things up. I'm sure that he's not allowed to change anything about this continuity. He's writing here in uncharted territory. This whole section of Star Trek is unexplored in canon. There's obviously an enormous gap between Star Trek IV and Star Trek V or Star Trek VI. We don't know what any of our cast members are doing. We have no idea what their world is like. No canon has ever, been, has ever swooped in to say that, and no canon ever will. So I don't know how much leeway he had to write this book, but I wish the whole time that I was reading it, I was thinking, all right, well, these, this, these jangling car keys are fun. I do love seeing all of these characters again, even Savick or Valeris or any of these other characters who... I, I, I do like seeing them again, and of course I have a sweet spot for the older seasoned Enterprise crew. I really have a sweet... I don't think... I think there's a great Star Trek novel to be written about that crew that has yet to be written. Uh, and that the closest I've ever seen was one part of a six-part series, so that doesn't really work. I, I would love that novel. I don't know how much permission you would need from Paramount to get the rights to do it. 
But I would love that novel. I've made this complaint before in older in novels that feature an older cast. I would like it if it seemed that way, and it almost never does. Uh, Cox does a little bit more along those lines than most writers, but uh, this thing, I don't think when it comes out that it will please a Star Trek fan. Except in the, in the dessert for supper unworthy way that it pleased me. That way it certainly will please you. All these characters, all these names, all these concepts coming back and having someone write knowledge of you about them, you'll love it. But do they come together into a book? Does any of it come together into a book? I don't think so. No. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you'll think different. Uh, certainly there's a heroic attempt made in the last third of the book to make it all come together. I just don't, I don't think it, it worked. I think Greg Cox, I've, no, I've encountered this in other Star Trek fiction of his. I really think that he should have had a long, cold discussion with himself if he doesn't have writing partners or a writing group or listen to Trek Reddit or Trek Facebook or anything like that. He should have had a long, cold conversation with himself and said, all right, well, how much of this am I going to get rid of in order to let the rest of it breathe? How much of this am I going to get rid of? I don't think he had that conversation. So this is an overstuffed Star Trek book. It's overstuffed with fun stuff. So you might like it. You might, in fact, like it a lot more than I do. I'm not sure that I'm making clear what I don't like about it. It had so much unrealized potential. Now, I don't know. I'm saying now that the reason it's, that its potential was untapped uh, is because it was overcrowded. But again, it could be that it's the reason its potential was untapped is because Greg Cox is not legally allowed to tap that potential. That could very well be. I don't know. Uh, what fun it would be to interview him uh, for this channel, but I have a feeling that he would consider it adversarial. And it's not at all meant to be adversarial. But nevertheless, if you want to know, if you want the member berries, a lot of fans of the original series will take that. They'll, they'll take whatever they can get. Imagine the ratings on an episode of Star Trek Strange New Worlds if William Shatner showed up as Captain Kirk. <laughs> Can it even be imagined? Imagine the ratings of such a show. Plenty of original series fans are still around and still want that. One last appearance of William Shatner as Captain Kirk. Not a bisexual Captain Kirk. Not a jerkwad Captain Kirk. <laughs> but the actual Captain Kirk. No idea how it would happen. The, the writers at Strange New Worlds have shown themselves to be very inventive. So it's easily possible. There are plenty of magical MacGuffins in the Star Trek universe. But that, that shows you that, that this kind of a novel will appeal to original series fans because this is all fan service. Uh, it's okay. If that's enough for you, it's ordinarily enough for me. In fact, it was enough for me in reading this. I just... I wanted more. I'm going to go for the rest of Book Trek 2024. I'm going to go back to old favorites. That's what I'm going to do for the rest of the month. I'm going to go back to old favorites so that I don't have any of this feeling of, gee, I wish. I don't want... I, do, I, I don't want disappointing reading experiences and I don't want to associate disappointing reading experiences with BookTube events. So I'm going to try to be careful about that for all the BookTube events for the rest of the month <laughs> and then i'll have a whole new set of, of perils in the month to come uh because i i am still assembling all of the different things that are happening in september on booktube the one i know for sure is sumerian september michael k vaughn's event celebrating conan the barbarian okay that's second nature i was doing sumerian september i was doing sumerian summer when mike was just a little baby in a cradle so <laughs> and before that so uh, uh, d dedicating a month to overdosing on conan in some way or another is absolutely fine by me i will not be disappointed there provided i stay away from the titan comic books i will not be disappointed uh, in other words provided i stay away from any contemporary realization of any of these things <laughs> any of them 21st century grievance politics twitter insanity blue-haired zealot interpretations of all these ips have been conquered by those by that kind of ideology and ruined intentionally to ruin them not to put forward an alternate vision but to ruin it for the people who love it because they're bad people they're on the wrong side of history uh as long as i steer clear of that and i know that now that i know that i can just as long as i steer clear of all of that uh there's plenty to enjoy <laughs> there's plenty certainly with conan there's plenty to enjoy uh so there's that. There are other September events as well, but I'm not, I'm not going to start looking on the other side of the fence. I'm going to read classic Star Trek. I'm going to revisit some classic Star Trek to finish out the month. 
Uh, so I'll wrap this up for now, and I'll hopefully have lots of smiles next time. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.